So I want to remind you that if you have um, questions or thoughts or anything pops up during the course of my talking, to please chat them to me so that um, we can have a group dialogue or I can answer your questions and things of that nature. So starting again with this notion of conditioning and what that means, um, we actually chose a very funny quote for this particular topic by Butch Hancock, who said, Life in Lubbock, Texas taught me two things. One is that God loves you and you're going to burn in hell. The other is that sex is the most awful, filthy thing on earth and you should save it for someone you love. So in that are two oxymoronic statements or paradoxical statements, depending on how you want to look at it. And often this is the kind of conditioning we grow up with. In fact, for many, many years now in our country, the CDC, uh, the Center for Disease Control, has had um, a national, I guess you want to call it uh, sex plan or sex education plan, um, for kids, and that plan is an abstinence-only plan that harkens back to, um, I think, when George Bush was in office. And that abstinence-only plan just said, don't do it, don't have sex. And that was the message that young people were getting when, of course, their bodies are completely excited and coming online and they're ready to start having sex in ways that um, are constructive if they're lucky, but if they're not, if they're unlucky, they're going to grow up with these messages that are contradictory. So the message was don't have sex, but the other messages around them was all about being sexual as quickly and as expertly as they possibly could be. So we saw these messages um, and continue to see them for young boys and young girls. When I say boys and girls, I should say young teens, really, um, that the message is don't have sex, but be ready for sex at any given time in terms of how you look, how you're dressed, um, you know, how well you're shaved, and things of that nature. Um, somebody's asking me about a phone number, so I'm just going to type in the phone number here in case people are having trouble with it. It's 213-416-1560. That's the call-in number. And somebody said they're getting a busy signal, but I have other people who've written in saying they can hear me, so um, hopefully you can get on. So we're not only conditioned by our culture at large, we're conditioned by caregivers, teachers, neighbors, peers, media, politicians, spiritual leaders, and the global culture at large. And if you take a minute to think about where your greatest conditioning came from, um, it usually starts with the culture of our immediate family, right, our parents. We um, This is evidenced by kids going to school on election day or pre-election, and in elementary schools, teachers will always take a poll to see who's going to win the presidency, and children in the fourth and fifth grade weigh in on who should win for president, because it's what they've heard at home. It's the conditioned uh, response that they have based on what they learn, and this comes from mimicking, uh, from modeling, and um, all sorts of messages that kids are getting in the household not just by po- about politics, but we're talking specifically about sex and sexuality. So oftentimes I query clients about what spiritual messages they got growing up, and um, it runs the gamut from nothing, like zero blank crickets, no conversation about sex, to people hearing their parents having sex in the other room, or worse yet, sexually explicit material just laying about the house, in which case I would call that more environmental sexual abuse. So, and somewhere in the middle, a healthy system is where kids, you know, see their parents being affectionate, holding hands, kissing, and where there's appropriate touch so they know that the adults have sex and that people do have sex and that it's okay and it's not shameful. But when there are extremes, either nothing or um, sex is all over the place, then what happens is that children will create a shame-based sexuality. 
Neighbors also can influence the conditioning we have based on what their beliefs are and how they behave, especially if they're neighbors that our parents are close to. Um, If they're people that come over every weekend, they're there for barbecues or babysitting, we sort of get by osmosis what those people's beliefs are. And certainly the media, it makes a difference if kids have um, a household where Fox News is running all the time or CNN is running all the time. One way or the other, they're going to be conditioned by those messages, especially if it's on in the background all the time. Um, spiritual leaders are another big place where we get conditioned. Um, if you go to church every Sunday, there's a culture of conditioning there around sex and sexuality. Um, if you don't go every Sunday but you go once a month, there's still going to be some spiritual conditioning about the messages around sex and sexuality. So while we're talking about this issue of culture and the microculture versus the macro culture, it might be useful for you to think about what influences those had on you or to jot down notes if things pop into your head. Um, and if there's something you want to say about that, feel free to uh, type it in. Some of these messages overtly attempt to control our thinking, committing psychological abuse, which is comparable to brainwashing. And what that means is when somebody grows up in a very rigid or strident household, there is a modicum of brainwashing that goes on because there are two parts to our brains. There's the left brain, which is probably on your right as I'm pointing to it, and the right brain. And these are very different operating systems, as I've suggested before and is pretty well borne out in the literature today. And The right brain is the brain of intuition and creativity and impulses coming up from the body, and it's active and speaking to us all the time. So when we have a gut impulse or when we're singing along with the melody of the music, it's the melody that evokes the right brain, whereas the left brain is repeating the words. So we need both of them to come together. But nonetheless, the conditioning happens on a bodily base, deeply implicit a level. And then our left brain interprets what's going on. So if you grow up in a household where somebody is telling you all the time that sex is bad, dirty, and wrong, um, like the guy from Lubbock, Texas, but you're having impulses because you're sitting next to a girl in class or a boy in class, and those impulses are belying what your parents are telling you at home, there's going to be a conflict. And what you're being told at home actually does become a form of psychological abuse that's comparable to brainwashing because it doesn't allow for the child's opinion. It doesn't allow for the child's curiosity. It doesn't allow for the child to say, I'm thinking about going out with this person, but this is what I don't like or like about them. Or I'm thinking about that person, and this kind of makes me feel squeamish, and I don't know what I should do. What do you think I should do? Those are healthy conversations that allow the kid the freedom to experiment with direct um, stewarding and coaching by the parent that gives them enough latitude to trip themselves up and learn life's lessons, but also is paying close enough attention that they're not doing something that's going to harm themselves. So any kind of closed system, any kind of absolute Even my saying this sounds like an absolute. Um, It's something that you should question. And and there's an old saying in Buddhism that if you meet the Buddha, you should kill him on the road. Um, That means that you should have critical thinking about any message that you get. And, of course, as children, we really don't have that opportunity because we're told to do what our parents tell us. And if we don't, oftentimes we feel scared or in danger. But as adults now, we have the opportunity to question all of these things, to turn them over, to keep what's useful, to get rid of what wasn't. Other influences parrot groupthink programming thoughtlessly, like a radio left blaring, or as I said, like a television left on all the time, um, where the media starts to embed itself in our heads, 
and then we don't think for ourselves. And that is the good news and the bad news of a free society. So an example is I turned on the news late one night this weekend, and I never watched the 11 o'clock news because I think it's a bad idea to put murders and um, home invasions and things like that into my head before I close my eyes because I don't want to have nightmares. And what I heard was really shocking. There was um, a home invasion here in L.A., which maybe some of you heard about, um, in a nice neighborhood, which was very chilling and terrifying. And then there was a horrible video of a man who pushed his child off a skateboard ramp, which was just unbelievably shocking and horrific. And then um, an example of a woman who went to a restroom in a movie theater and some guy followed her in and went, attempted to get inside the stall by crawling under the stall, ostensibly to molest her in some ways. So this was one story after another in the span of less than 15 minutes. And it was completely shocking and horrifying. And I turned it off and I thought, I'm glad I don't watch the nightly news. But if I watched the nightly news every night, I would never leave my house. I would be terrified to go to a movie. I would be suspect of every parent with a boy at a skateboard ramp. And, you know, the thing about the home invasion, I just would never answer my door. So that becomes a programming by the greater media, which is all about producing fear and danger and discomfort because there's no good news you know, evening television show. So you want to be careful about how much information comes into your psyche. Sometimes I recommend that people go on a media diet where they just turn the TV and the radio off for a week um, and their computers when it comes to surfing around on the net. And just notice what happens to your psyche when all of that blather, all that negativity, all of that fear gets washed away. If the bombardment is constant enough, it does start to become ingrained in our memory. And so this cultural conditioning by way of media is a bigger political conversation. We're meant to be talking about sex and sexuality and relationship. But just notice, again, what part of conditioning is yours and what belongs to other forces, whether it's the media, your family, your church group, uh, your work group, Uh, your peer group, what do you really like, what don't you like, what has meaning to you, what doesn't. So any questions or comments about any of that? All right. Well, negative conditioning makes harmful thoughts feel safe and insecurities seem seem secure. And what that means is that What I was saying, if you live in a world that's small and you just sit at home and you watch TV all the time um, and you think the world's a scary place, then it feels safe to stay indoors and not to venture too far out and not to make too many big moves. And um, that is a way to limit one's life quickly. And insecurities, well, I live in a dangerous world, so that's just the way it is. Um, Or I live in an abusive household, so I'm going to choose an abusive uh, partner because that's just how life is and that's how relationships are. Both of those ways of thinking become incredibly limiting. I talked to somebody recently who um, was actually in recovery from sex addiction who was endeavoring to date and was feeling a lot of shame about a particular sex act because they thought it was unchristian. And I don't know that there's a book about Christianity or any other religion that delineates what sex acts are okay and what are not. But what this man was telling me was by no stretch of the imagination a paraphilia, meaning something that's thought to be terribly distinctly different from the norm or something a greater population would think was weird or wrong. Um, And even if it were, That's a different story, but in this case, it was not, and I told him that at least in Los Angeles in 2014, what he was talking about was not abnormal at all. Once upon a time, it probably was considered such, but it's not today, and what would happen if he gave himself permission to engage in that behavior, to talk to a partner about liking it, to break through the conditioning that says you're not Christian or you're wrong or you're dirty if you do this thing, what would that then mean about him? 
And so I would invite you to think about what sexual preferences you have and whether you think those things are bad or wrong or if it's your conditioning that tells you they're bad or wrong or if they're really bad or wrong, meaning are they illegal, Uh, do they endanger innocent people, Um, are they something that has you perpetrating on another human being. So think about what those things are and what your conditioning tells you about what's okay sexually and what isn't. When we recognize distortions in our thinking, whether it's about what we like sexually or or not, or whether the world is a safe place or not, long-term negative conditioning can give these distortions a sense of familiarity and we start to feel disloyal, negating them. So this is something that happens to most of us when it comes to growing up in households that aren't completely functional. So we think that we're being disloyal to a parent if we, um, for example, go to therapy for the first time. And I remember when I first went to therapy and I was challenged about looking at my relationship with my parents and how disloyal I felt thinking that what they did was harmful to me in some way. And it's important to make the distinction of people doing the best they can because typically they do. No matter how egregious things get, parents will tell you they love their kids and they did the best they could. And most people really did do the best they could. But the effect of the best they could on the child is sometimes really detrimental and harmful. So to be able to tease out what is being um, kind of codependently loyal to another and versus taking care of yourself is what you need in order to differentiate and become stronger and stand on your own two feet and understand what your own preferences are. So pay attention to being loyal to negative conditioning um, and starting to break those constraints. So this isn't about accosting your parents or your grandparents or your spiritual leader from your childhood and telling them how horrible they were. It's about you understanding that there were things that they might have said that distorted your own personal preference and that you don't need to believe that anymore. And what does it feel like internally when you start to say no to those negative thoughts? Obviously, a lot of people turn to drugs and alcohol when they start feeling pain about these discrepancies and they want to mitigate these early influences. So by um, getting drunk, um, the sensitive brain only mirrors the original trauma because it's overpowered by this extrinsic programming. So... A lot of times when people get drunk or high, it just magnifies what the problem was to begin with. They think that uh, they're going to make the problem go away because they're anesthetizing themselves, and that works temporarily when you're completely drunk or falling down or drunk regularly. You're not really thinking about much of anything because you're making yourself sick over time. Um, But a lot of times what that does, I would say almost always what that does, is it keeps people stuck in the original trauma. So if you've ever met anybody who has a long-term alcohol problem or drug problem and you start to talk to them, they're constantly lamenting the past and what was done to them. And so when they're no longer 10 years old but 40 and 50 years old, they really sound like victims. And they were victimized and they were hurt badly, but they're living out this victim mythology, this victim lifestyle that keeps them stuck and keeps them unable to move forward because they're not willing to really drop that conditioning, drop those negative beliefs and thoughts, and start to reach towards getting help and finding out who they are authentically, who they really are. Does anybody have any thoughts or questions at this point? Anybody ever used... Oh, here's a question. Um, Okay, so this person writes, your description of patients feeling loyal to their negative conditioning reminds me of the insight from object relations theory that the, quote, bad object is usually felt by the child slash patient to be the more powerful one. And I would say that, yes, that neurobiology has borne this out, that 
um, in object relations, we talk about this interject of the internalized other. And it's true. When our parents are attuning to us and socializing us, we're taking them in. Those messages are being encoded not just in our brain, but in our bodies, in our nervous systems. And typically, the more negative, the more dangerous parent is going to override the more positive one because fear is a very powerful autonomic state. And when we get enough fear coming into our system, it has a system set point at a a point of hyper arousal, if you will. So we're constantly in a hyper vigilant state. If there's enough fear that creates chronic anxiety. And we could say that that is a, quote, interject of the other, but it's also literally encoded into the autonomic nervous system. If that kind of negative um, person, interject, object, is so intense, eventually the child, many children, will just dissociate. And so they're no longer in this hyper-aroused state. They live in a hypo-aroused state. So if some of you feel like you're checked out chronically, that you don't feel a whole lot, it's because you just your system just couldn't take all that negativity, that constant criticism, that constant belittling. And so the best way out of that was just to check out. That's a more difficult conditioning to start to change, and that really requires some long-term psychotherapy help. Um, if you're in a highly anxious state all the time because you had an overpowering parent, then that too is going to require some help from professionals. That kind of hyperarousal can be helped greatly through some self-help practices like meditation, breathing, um, healthy massage and touch will help to bring that system more into balance also. So these conditions that we get are not just negative beliefs, but they're literally encoded into our brains and nervous systems. And the good news is that we can get ourselves out of that with some help and with lots of work. The bad news is we can't just think our way out of these things. Um, I'm getting microphone instructions, so hopefully people can hear better that way. So let's see, where am I here in our PowerPoint presentation? Um, the, tra the tragedy of negative conditioning is that life usually meets our expectations, which in this case are our most negative ones. So how many of you have been victims of of having things go wrong all the time. Like everything goes wrong all the time. It's always gone wrong. It chronically goes wrong. So you start to believe that that's just how life is. Life is a bad deal. Nothing ever works out. And if something bad could happen, it's going to happen to you. That is a product of negative programming, negative conditioning, and it's a product of how we start to conceptualize our life. And it's very challenging and very difficult to get out of because it becomes a chicken and egg situation. Um, there was a book written many years ago called when, good things happen to, when Bad Things Happen to Good People. It's a book worth taking a look at today even. But we have to start to look at how we set ourselves up for these bad things to happen too. How are we creating our reality by the, not only the thoughts we have, but the people that we put into our environment that actually help reinforce these bad problems occurring over and over and over again? And that conditioning can also be a form of codependence where we choose people that will inevitably harm us, leave us by the wayside, um, do bad things to us because it's what we're used to getting. So take a look at the conditioning messages that you got, the kind of people you surround yourself with, and what ha happens circumstantially to um, sort of prove that this is the way life is over and over again. Counter the negative programming and start to shine a light on what we call stinking thinking in the recovery circles. Um, start to look at how negative your thoughts really are and also how negatively in, uh, you judge other people. So whether you see somebody crossing the street, whether it's your partner, whether it's a coworker, how much are you always judging other people about what's wrong with them? 
And then start to look at the negative messages that you give yourself. Do you call yourself stupid? Do you call yourself dumb? Um, do you have any compassion for yourself? Or are you always beating yourself up and treating yourself the way you were treated in childhood? And that is something you can start to change today. Uh, when you hear those negative thoughts, just notice them. Don't criticize yourself for having them. Don't try to push them away. Just notice them and say, wow, listen to how I just talked to myself. Or look at how I'm getting angry at myself about something that's really not in my control and that's not really for my well-being. So an example I can give you of that is recently I've started to have some pains in my hands because I type all the time. I'm typing constantly all day, every day. And I was really getting frustrated and angry that I was starting to feel pain. It might be carpal tunnel syndrome. I don't know yet. Um, and when I really started to get present with the pain, without the story of um, I shouldn't be typing that much or I'm negligent or I don't give myself a break, you know, without the club coming out and beating myself up with it, and I just sat quietly and I let myself feel the throbbing in my fingers, I noticed I started to have a lot of compassion for myself. And I thought, wow, I've really done something to hurt myself. How can I stop hurting myself? How can I stop typing, start making more phone calls, or give myself a break for a couple of days, ice my hands, not make a big drama about this and turn it into... Um, some nightmare where I have to go have my surgery on both of my hands or, you know, some other atrocity, and just, like, relax a little bit with it and get quiet and tend to myself. And that counters my conditioning of um, having done something wrong. So can you think of something along those lines where you need to have more compassion for your conditioning and just be with what's happening as opposed to beating yourself up for it. And if you can and you want to send me an example, please do. All right, this is a very quiet crowd today. Early childhood conditioning, as I've said before, is essential for our growth, but hanging it on, onto it in adulthood is like a butterfly clinging to its cocoon. So shame is a good example of this, and I talk a lot about shame, that shame is a pro-social function. It's what keeps the child from hurting itself. So the minute the mother says no to the child, it feels shame, which is useful if the child's going to put its hand on a hot burner. The mother says no, the child recoils, it feels shame, and it doesn't do it again. And that saves a lot of pain and agony on multiple levels. Um, so that's where it's essential for our growth, when our mother says, don't ride your bike down the middle of the street, or come home before it gets dark, or eat your fruits and vegetables, or don't do this, don't do that. I mean, we're getting those messages all the time, and um, we are also giving those messages to our kids all the time. So when they are constructive for our growth, they're very use useful. But when they have been destructive in childhood, and we cling to them and we bring them into adulthood, that's when we start to have problems with them. So if a parent told you um, some fairy tale about how you were going to get injured if you did something and you never do anything adventurous, that is a version of a butterfly clinging to its cocoon. At what point do you start to take risks in your life, try new things, and do things regardless of whether maybe you skin a knee or not? So somebody said, I would have to say, um, obsessing about someone I'm interested in and then getting mad at myself for doing that. And that is a really great example of what I was talking about before, is that if the tendency is to obsess about somebody um, because... You just do because you're sensitive or maybe you're um, on the love-addicted spectrum. 
One of the ways to help yourself is to not perpetrate more violence on yourself by yelling at yourself or hating yourself for doing it, but just to notice the tendency, which is the mindfulness portion of this, to say, wow, look at that. Look at how my brain is running. Um, what in Buddhism is also called the monkey mind, the monkey running up and down the tree, up and down the tree ad nauseum, and just noticing those thoughts and then see if you can track into your body and notice what you're feeling in that moment. And where in your body are you feeling it? And you might notice tension in your gut or in your heart or a pervasive feeling of sadness. And if you dive deeply into the sadness, what is in that sadness? It may be a loneliness that you've always known or an emptiness that harkens back to childhood. And if you can let yourself feel that feeling and have compassion for the child who never got what it needed or got little of what it needed, then the obsessing about the other becomes much less egregious or much less of a crime. It becomes something more natural, like, of course that makes sense. Why would I do anything other than that, given where I came from and given what I've learned? So if you can keep giving yourself a break and not get mad for what you do, but get interested in it, get curious about it, then you're going to have more space in your psyche, and that will help to break up some of this conditioning. So another silly example um, in Southern California, this is all we've got. But in the but in the northeast, uh, northeast in the northeast, if you were waking up every day in the winter and you were miserable or angry about how cold it was and how much it was snowing, you had a miserable, angry winter. If instead you just noticed it and said, ah, another cold day, another day of trudging through the snow, another day when I have to bundle up, isn't this curious? And you could just be with what was. You had a lot less suffering. Um, than the person who was miserable because it wasn't 80 degrees every day. If, on the other hand, you're miserable because it's 80 degrees every day, it's the same thing, that you wish it would be cloudy or cooler or raining or some other thing. That's the way we create suffering in life. The key to liberation, in large part, is to be with what is. And that doesn't give us license to go do more of it. Well, I just ate an entire chocolate cake, so I'm going to be with what is and eat a second one. No, that's destructive and dangerous. It's about noticing that I did it, feeling how sick I feel, noticing that I don't want to do that anymore, and then taking measures to help assist me so I don't do it anymore. That is an act of kindness. That's about stopping the violence on oneself. If one's conditioning equated worthiness with rigidly idealized behavior, particularly in regard to sexuality and relationships, the feeling of not being good enough can become especially habitual. And this is what I'm talking about, that you can't equate your worthiness with being perfect. That's what a rigidly idealized behavior would be. Um, we're always going to come up short. There's a, a beautiful book called The Spirituality of Imperfection, and I don't remember the author of it right now, um, but it's a really lovely book. And it's a book that I think some of the 12-step tenets are based on, that recovery is a spirituality of imperfection, that today is about progress, not perfection. Today I'm going to do the best I can, even though my conditioning is such that um, it's going to be challenging for me to do it differently. But because I have my eye on my conditioning, because I have an intention to do something different, that is enough to help get change moving. And when I enlist other people to help me, then I don't have to do it myself. One of the troubles is, is that we identify so strongly with so-called personal points of view, all of which, of which were given to us at some time by another, that we often don't know how to not identify with them. And this is tricky business, too, because some of our personal points of view, we cling to you know, dearly to. And if we didn't have people and if we ourselves didn't believe strongly in, you know, whatever our beliefs are, we wouldn't fight for our freedoms, I'm afraid. So whatever you strongly believe in um, is worth holding on to if it's not limiting you. 
And if you hold strongly to it, it's always worth examining because in that examination, we might find a glimmer of change. So for an example, one of the things that's been in the news has been this prisoner exchange. And I don't want to get too political here because we're talking about sex. Um, But there are a whole bunch of people who thought exchanging one prisoner for several prisoners was a bad idea. Some people thought we shouldn't have done the exchange at all, and some people thought that saving this one man, this American man's human life, was worth more than you know just several other prisoners being bargained for. So philosophically, I can come down on any of those sides of the argument because it's all about being humane. Politically, I might land on one side or the other because I have a sense of what's right or wrong. But even with that sense of right or wrong, I want to consider my, quote, rightness and make a space for the possibility of my wrongness. And in that, I might get a little bit of space um, to be open-minded to some kind of change. So all of us should look at um, what we strongly hold dear in our personal points of view, especially in our relationships, because we can use those to bludgeon our partners with and to get self-righteous about, because it's how I was raised. The way I was raised, dot, 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 the way I was raised is that we sit down at the table at 6 o'clock every night for dinner, and anybody that doesn't do that is irreverent or doesn't believe in family time. That sounds like a colonizing belief, and it sounds like something I'm clinging to dearly, and maybe if I were a little open-minded about it, I wouldn't be bludgeoning my partner or shaming my partner, and I might be open to a different style of eating or a different time to eat. Um, And this can hold true also with how we behave um, sexually, Uh, that I was raised in a way where people only have sex behind closed doors with the lights out. That's kind of limiting, as is eating dinner at 6 o'clock only every single night. All of these are rigid, limiting beliefs. And if we think that imposing those on our partners and our partners acquiescing to them is love, uh, we've got another thing coming. So any thoughts about any of that? So as I've been saying, it's up to us to change the channel of our customary thinking. No one else can possibly find a new frequency to attune to our individual truth. And I believe this proposition of individual truth is a lifelong seeking. Um, I notice there are things now that I used to hold dear, that I used to believe in, that I don't anymore. There are times when I have no idea what I believe anymore. And there are times when I recognize that I'm much more flexible in some ways and much more um, sure and inflexible in other ways. And they've sort of toppled on their head as I've gotten older also. So what are the ways that um, you need to change your customary thinking? Are there things that you might want to make a list about that you believe have been absolutes that you're not sure about anymore and new things you're more sure about than you used to be sure about? And can you talk to your partner about that? And then how does that conditioning limit your sexuality too? If you're only accustomed to having sex in one way and you think that's the right way or the least shameful way or you have judgments about other ways, other positions, other sexual acts, it may be worth noting what your judgments are um, about those sexual acts. And where did those judgments come from? Are they yours? Are they something you've read about? Are they that you think your mother would be mortified if she knew you were engaging in them? And why is your mother's psyche still in your head when you're having sex? So this whole process of mirror of intimacy is about getting to know yourself and asking yourself difficult questions about who you are and what you want and what you like. So does anybody have any questions at this point? Thoughts, ideas? Somebody says, can you talk about the Cutting New Grooves chapter in Erotic Intelligence? How does working with a therapist affect childhood conditioning? Well, when we talk about cutting new grooves, that's sort of a colloquial or slang way of talking about creating new neural pathways. And 
One of the things we know about the brain is that it's highly plastic and highly susceptible. And in fact, a new study came out last week in the Journal of Addiction Medicine um, about the effects of Internet pornography on the brain. And prior to this research that's just come out, there's been a lot of controversy about whether it does or doesn't change certain areas of the brain. And this study shows that it indeed does. It affects the part of the brain that has to do with instinctual learning and also the part that um, affects our consciousness in the world. And so that would lead me to believe, or it lines up with what I've seen clinically, that people who use a lot of pornography, and I'm talking about compulsive not recreational use, come across in ways that are sort of dull because they're dulling out these specific parts of the brain. That is a groove that's being connected or created in the brain. So if you imagine walking in your backyard every day, pacing in your backyard every day, up and down the same strip of grass over and over again, month after month, year after year, you're going to have a groove. There's going to be a divot or a small ditch that you've traversed over and over and over again. And that's what happens in the brain. These neuronal networks and pathways get very vibrant, very tenacious. And if you overuse one thing, something else is going to atrophy. Something else will start to die away because you're not giving it its attention, which is a different metaphor than the grass metaphor. So if your attention is only on one thing, you're going to hyper-create that, and that could be wonderful if you're an artist. But if you're doing something that is limiting your possibilities in life, what's happening is other areas of the brain aren't getting the same kind of blood flow, attention, and growth. And that's what I talk about in erotic intelligence. So when you work with a therapist around this childhood conditioning and the therapist starts to challenge gently some of these ideas, these thoughts, and these behavior patterns and helps you to regulate your fear, so your fear of not doing what your father said would be good for you and doing what you want to do, which feels a little scary and a little irreverent and a little disloyal. But you've got a guide there who says, you know what, it's really okay if you go try that thing. Your dad's not going to know about it. He's not going to hurt you. You're, a, you're an adult human being, um, and it sounds like it would be really good for you then that starts to create new, not only psychological permission, but a regulatory permission in the body, and it starts to activate areas of the brain that maybe heretofore weren't activated. So having a fair witness, whether it's a sponsor in the program, a therapist, a trusted order, in order to help shift some of these conditions are really important because we um, need other people to help us. We don't do very well in a vacuum. Somebody says there's a barrier to letting go of old beliefs. Um, one barrier to letting go of old beliefs is the anxiety of not having something else to hold, uh, something else on hand to replace it. The mindfulness approach that you mentioned seems a good antidote, and it attempts to create a space where we don't have to foreclose immediately on one belief or another, then I would say that's true, that um, this idea of having to have something to replace what we're doing is very useful in recovery circles. So if, for example, um, you have an addiction, that means that you're spending an inordinate amount of time doing the same thing over, over, and over again, and you don't know what else to do with your free time. So if you are a workaholic, for example, and you stop working, you don't know what to do with yourself because you don't know what you like to do recreationally. So that's an opportunity to go take classes, go learn to paint, play golf, join a hiking club, learn to sail, because there will be other people around you that are like-minded, that enjoy those same things. And in that way, you're replacing your work with some other organized activity where you can start to 
meet other people and see, wow, I actually kind of like doing other things besides working. Working is a more benign metaphor. Obviously, if you um, have a sex or love addiction or drug or alcohol problem, having other things to replace your addiction are essential to your recovery, and it's essential to changing the brain, without a doubt. Um, Mindfulness is useful when you're creating a space around beliefs. So you don't have to give the belief up, and you also don't have to name the current belief as wrong or bad, as I said. You can instead be conscious about the belief, have compassion around the belief, and really question it. Like, do I still really need that belief? Do I need to call myself an idiot because I overtyped and my hands are sore? Or can I look at the bigger picture and say, wow, I was actually very productive with all that typing. I think I overdid it. I need to stop now, and I need to do what I need to do to help myself myself and learn a lesson from this and not, you know, crucify myself for having done it. Uh, with creating conditioning patterns, is it common to experience loss aversion? Um, well, I would say yes. I mean, anytime we give up one thing and we're trying something new, it's frightening. And there's also something about saying goodbye to old patterns and old conditioning. So this is another kind of silly um, example, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. I often look at dresses that I used to love to wear in my 20s and 30s. I just love them. And if I were to wear them now, I think I would look ridiculous in them. So there's some grief and loss about, wow, that's so cute, but eh, not so much, not on me today. And so there's loss to that. And it also leaves me with, well, what do I think I look good in, and what do I want to wear that's appropriate for me now? So there's a gap. So there's what was, clinging to what was, is going to be bad form and embarrassing and not so good. So I have to say goodbye to what was, and I have to turn towards not knowing what is. And there is some loss, and there's some fear about what's going to be okay. Not huge, obviously. We're talking about clothing, so it's not rocket science. But there is a transition that we have to be willing to live in. And it's that transition where magic happens, I think. It's the magic of not knowing, where mystery unfolds, where many miracles and grace happen, where something could show up that you had no idea about, that you just love, that had you been clinging to the old pattern or the old experience, you never in a million years would have thought about. And sometimes this has to do with people also. This idea that, you know, I've had a type my whole life and I just have to go out with that type of person. And when I get rid of that limiting thought and I'm open, I might all of a sudden meet somebody who grabs my attention, who really, you know, kind of knocks my socks off because they're funny or they're smart and they're clever in ways I never would have thought of for myself. But now I'm open to the possibility of seeing myself in a different way through somebody else. Somebody asks, how long does it take to change your brain once you stop engaging your addictive behavior? Well, there are studies, speculative studies, that say it takes 90 days. And the program of Alcoholics Anonymous says it takes 90 days to build a new character. So we know that at least 90 days, at least three months of stopping the behavior altogether and giving the brain a rest before um, we can start to see what we're really dealing with. With Young men who've been li looking at internet pornography since the time they were really young, um, you know, early adolescence, um, teenage years, early adolescence forward, uh, when they have trouble with their erections and they have to stop using internet porn in order to regain their erections, it can take them up to four, four to five months is what I've read. Um, that's a long time because it's a brain problem. It's an exhaustion in the brain from looking at those images. It's not a penile problem. For older men, men, let's say, in their 40s, 50s, who were not uh, raised with Internet pornography, if they stop looking at Internet pornography, it only takes them about three months to regain their erection. And that lines up with the 90-day theory of 90 days to change your brain. So the more we engage in something, the more we condition our brains, our bodies, our thoughts, our beliefs, um, is evidenced by exercising. If you exercise regularly and you feel good and your body looks good, it's because you've conditioned it to look good. Likewise with your heart if you engage in aerobic exercise. So conditioning is everything. Um, 
if you happen with, you know, to catch yourself in these toxic patterns, as I've been talking about, start with empathy for your own authentic love growing self. That's what we're talking about here. This is a process of growth. It's not a process of beating ourselves up. That just perpetrates more violence, and that's what we're trying to get out of. So ask yourself, what conditioning did you receive as a child from your caregivers, community, culture, people we've been talking about? And do these messages still support your self-image, your relationships, and your dreams? Or are they hampering you? Are they holding you back? And if they're holding you back, remember that you can... um, You know, any time, get help. You can get help by calling our offices at 843-9902, which is the CHS um, intake line, and somebody who's happy to talk to you at any time about relationships, conditioning, uh, getting help, whatever you need. And um, if you can, get yourself to a meditation class, a 12-step meeting, start working out, stop overeating. Today's the day for you to end this conditioning. Um, And as they say, today's the first day of the rest of your life. So make it a good day. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing you. um, I'm hearing you. I look forward to hearing you always and being in these conversations, but also look forward to seeing you in July. All right. Thank you.